and back in our lives scp02 future cannabis project back once again on this lovely wednesday we've got another special uh IPM presentation from Zenthanol today. I'm going to be keeping an eye on chat, everybody. We're definitely going to have a Q&A section at the end of this. So write them down, keep track of them. We'll get to all your questions. But please let me turn this over to the host of the show, the man with the most. I almost rhymed that properly. Uh, how you doing today, Matthew Gates? I'm doing all right. I'm ready to talk about this uh, nefarious pest that many people have encountered and dealt with. Good. Yes, me too. I know a lot of people were looking forward to this episode. I also saw it be a requested topic. So that's great that you're able to kind of respond so quickly and put together the presentation that you did for everybody today. I know they're going to enjoy it. Thank you so much. And uh, one of the real benefits of doing this is that it also helps me keep sharp as well. And um in the research that I'll be talking about here, a lot of it has been published 2021, 2022, or uh, 2020 even. Um, so I'm very excited that I'll be giving you guys up-to-date information um, about the rice root aphid and some of their capabilities as aphids generally. So that is this presentation, the rice root aphid presentation. The Latin name uh, or the binomial name is Ropal Siphum Rufi Abdominale. And uh, you'll find that a lot of this comes from my pest primer series, uh, which I have on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol, for those who are interested. And if you'd like to know more about me, Matthew Gates, uh, I'll talk about, I've talked about myself more in the first episode of this series, so you can check that out first. What is a pest is the presentation, and this would be one of those pests, the rice root aphid. So at the beginning, I want to sort of go over some basic things about aphids in general. Now, this will be true for other aphids that attack cannabis, for example, like the cannabis aphid, but uh, it will also be true for other aphids that people will deal with as well. Uh, this general information is important to know because it gives you some context about why they're so good at what they do, essentially. So I have, uh, and you'll find that this is the style for the rest of the presentation, I have cited my sources for certain research, uh, oftentimes color coding some of the statements that I'm basing what I'm saying on, uh, on the, the research um, that I have here below. So if you're interested in reading more, you can certainly do that by taking a look at the research reports. But here we go. So aphids, um, they've been around for a very long time. Uh, the ancestral aphids, uh, sort of aphid shaped bodied insects, essentially, that are descendant or that are ancestral, have probably been here for about 260 million years ago. Now that predates flowering plants by, a, uh, by some estimates, a, long, a large margin. And that's important to know because aphids have been feeding on these plants for such a long time that now that we're talking about cannabis specific, um, you know, these aphids have had a long time to co-evolve with sort of ancestral plants. Uh, and that's an important context point to keep in mind. They're also very closely related to other insects that people deal with. You can see on the left here, um, I have a phylogenetic uh, map, basically, of, um, of descendants. So you have here the aphidomorpha, which is the group that we're talking about here. Um, that's that uh, the small blue, or on the blue side here on the upper left diagram. Um, so they're closely related to a few other insects, namely the scale insects with the coccids. Uh, but uh, they diverged a while uh, a while ago um, from other organisms that you might recognize, like white flies, which is which are the Eliarodomorpha, and uh, the Cylodia, which are the psyllids. So that's just part of that context. Now, 99% of species of aphids are monophagous or oligophagous, so they only feed on a few um, plants. So this is a theme with aphids; they tend to be very host optimized and, and they specialize a lot of times on a few groups of plants. Now about 1% of species are polyphagous. So they feed on many plants. They're kind of what we call a generalist. Although if you look at the research, some of that even is a little bit confusing or, or perhaps um, maybe not as generalized as we thought. And there's a lot of this based on their um, sort of resistance to plants and, and their genetic capabilities, uh, which can change kind of rapidly, which we'll go over later. 90% of species are non-host alternating, uh, and about 10% spe of species do alternate between an herbaceous host, so like a, 
like a non-woody kind of plant, usually grass, uh, some sort of a grass species, um, and or in a particular case of the rice root aphid, and uh, a woody plant. So those are usually seasonal. So spring and summer is usually the herbaceous plant, and a woodier plant in the autumn and fall, or uh, sorry, the autumn and winter rather. Um, so that's important because the rice root aphid is one of these species. It's also one of the species that is pretty generalistic. It can feed on a bunch of different plants. So it's kind of a um, sort of a, a super aphid in that way. Not only does it feed on a bunch of different plants, but uh, it also, um, uh, it'll alternate between these two kinds of, um, of, of host types. So you have to be vigilant, essentially. The implication for you is that you have to consider this in your IPM strategy that uh, this rice root aphid, uh, despite having a name like rice root aphid, can be on a bunch of different kinds of plants. Aphids feed, aphids generally make, um, you know, quote unquote clonal um, uh, offspring. Usually colonies are composed completely of females and they typically don't have to have a male to reproduce. So that's again, another important implication. So if you get only one aphid, or a couple of aphids in your plants because maybe you put in some cuttings um, that were infested or because right outside your door there is a plant that they could feed on um, you know that is a potential vector point and it's an important thing to consider when dealing with rice root aphid and trying to prevent it rather than treating it when it already establishes um, i want to say that um, their populations double quickly uh, because of the sort of clonal reproduction it is very very quick uh, and extensive and um, over time aphids have been seen and this gets into some of that research i was talking about that's more recent uh, aphids have been shown to be able to specialize on hosts really easily so populations even of groups that we might call generalists will develop populations that will specialize on a particular host group. Um, so like, for example, in the case of cannabis, uh, there very well may be populations of rice root aphids that have over time, and this only takes a few years to happen, a blink of an eye in evolutionary terms for them to adapt uh, pretty readily, especially to a uh, host that they're already um, somewhat well adapted to already. And uh, it's not something that I can know for sure, and I'm not sure that anyone knows at this moment, but that could be the case for cannabis. Um, and also aphids account for most plant virus transmissions uh, because their feeding style that they use, the way that they feed, uh, is really, really good at transmitting uh, the virus without really disturbing a lot of the cells or killing them. So that's another thing to, to keep in mind. And of course, cannabis is not very well understood with this virome. So in the future, we might find that rice root aphid is a, a competent vector of uh, something important to us. And if you're wondering what this extinct uh, gymnosperm is doing, this is kind of a, uh, a picture example on the right of some of the earlier sort of uh, plants that some of the very first aphid type uh, insects were feeding on uh, so long ago. A little bit more on their physiology. So how do aphids actually feed on plants? So First, they have to, they use uh, olfaction and they use their sight to be able to uh, detect a, a plant. Usually uh, the color is of course important. Uh, most plants are green, but also plants that have different shades of colors and especially yellow and ultraviolet um, sort of reflection, which are not things that we can always see with our own eyes, um, are going to be potentially incredibly attractive to aphids. So um, there are possibly structures and substances and things um, like paints and stuff that might be on your house or near where you live, um, perhaps your car, even in some cases, might be attractive in a way that you didn't expect. So that, that could be a thing to consider. I know that there's uh, examples of people getting bombarded by thrips. I've seen um, and other people, other insects rather, because their, their truck was a particular color, usually like a bright yellow is very attractive. Um, of course, yellow sticky cards are yellow for this reason, too. Once they come into contact with the plant, they uh, have to use gustatory cues um, and also more olfaction, so smelling, to tell if the plant is suitable or perhaps not suitable. And they have to take uh, basically a taste test to figure that out. Um, sugars are phagostimulant, so the more sugar content in the tissue, in the phloem, 
generally leads to them feeding more on the on the plant, assuming it's a good host. And um, you can see in this picture here, uh, the upper left diagram at acceptance on that uh, that lane, you can kind of see why we call this aphids are the group, but they're part of a larger group called Hemitera. And that's because they have half wings, which you can kind of see they have two pairs of wings, but one of those pairs is kind of halfway. And so if you're trying to identify an aphid and tell what it is, if you happen to be dealing with a winged form, which not all forms are winged, uh, this could be one way that you can tell it from, say, a fungus snap, for example, which is part of the diptera, or two wings, but they both have the same kind of wing, or rather just one pair. Um, so their physiology is composed of a lot of things that are very important to them. They have many enzymes and proteins that break things down, but they also have their own microbiome. So they have these special cells called bacteriocytes, and aphids will either pick up uh, bacteria from their hosts or from associating with other plants that can be what are called secondary endosymbionts that are really good for them in the same way that plant uh, symbionts can be uh, highly uh, beneficial and mutualistic. But they also have some that they transfer to their progeny vertically from parent to offspring. On the right, we have an example of some of these bacteria that have been identified and some of the effects that they have that are beneficial. Um, so again, you know, it's very important to consider when we're talking about natural uh, cultivation and microbiome, you know, what are these organisms that are being um, applied? And uh, also, so, you know, not just your own plant microbiome, but also the microbiome of pests can shape your local ecosystem and cultivation context. Okay, so how do aphids eat? I think this is incredibly important for people who are trying to understand what kind of damage aphids actually cause to their plants and also how they can kind of um, understand uh, some techniques that are used to sort of prime plants against aphid feeding or also to um, understand how they might be ineffective potentially as well. So I want to go through the schematic here on the, at the left side. Um, I'm actually going to uh, read it verbatim. So the red arrows indicate key processes for the plant aphid interaction, right? So the aphid has gone onto the plant, it's taken its stylet, and it's penetrated the plant cell, uh, um, the epi uh, epidermis of the plant. And it's, it's searching for the phloem. It's searching for the, the channels of sugars and other nutrients that are moving throughout the plant here. And that's what the diagram is showing. Aphids penetrate the apoplast with their stylet. So the apoplast is that sort of phloem channel. Uh, and they move it between individual cells while exuding a gelling saliva into the intercellular space, encasing the stylet in a salivary sheath and sealing off any cell leaks caused by the insertion process. During insertion, aphids puncture mesophyll cells and inject small amounts of watery saliva. So they have two kinds of saliva containing effector proteins before sucking back some of the liquid to assess the plant quality. After the phloem is reached, aphids alternate between sap ingestion and secretion of watery saliva containing effector proteins into the phloem to prevent callus deposition at sieve plates, which are these things you can see in the diagram uh, at the letter four. Uh, these callus um, particles are important because uh, plants use them to block off these plates um, in order to deny nutrition to the plant or to the aphid rather. So even if a plant is able to survive um, infestation or able to get rid of the aphid or whatever, there are some long lasting effects to not only the plant's immune system that they oftentimes suppress pretty heavily locally, um, but also, you know, potentials uh, that have to do with the movement of nutrients and transfer of nutrients from the roots to the shoots, so to speak. Plant cells synthesize defensive secondary metabolites, of which a subset is transported into the phloem. Secondary metabolites are ingested during feeding and may be taken up into the hemocyl by passive or active transport across the gut membrane. Secondary metabolites either accumulate in the hemocyl or are excreted back into the hindgut and exuded with the aphids honeydew together with all remaining metabolites. People, this is a topic I see very often um, they're curious how plants, or rather how aphids, are um, able to be effective despite the various secondary metabolites and toxins and proteins that they're able to produce to defend themselves. 
sorry, to defend themselves. And the reason for this is because essentially aphids are really great at suppressing the creation of these compounds in the first place. And also uh, some of them even will use these toxins and sequester them in their bodies so that they're toxic to their predators. Um, or they'll just excrete them in, a, in their honeydew. They're very good at um, uh, getting a lot of uh, food and getting rid of it very quickly. So they can just kind of make that go faster and uh, not suffer the toxic effects. On the right here, we have examples of what aphid presence can do on certain plants. And uh, you'll notice that a lot of these uh, aphids like Ropal, Siphon, Patty, um, these are very closely related to the rice root aphid that we're gonna be talking about here. And uh, you can see that basically their presence has had beneficial effects for others in the colony. So again, as aphids multiply that sort of immune suppressing effect also multiplies and it certainly concentrates where they're feeding, but it can also move generally out into the plant. And I bring this up because it can cause all kinds of weird effects uh, on plant health. Uh, moving a little bit forward, plant resistance to aphids requires sort of a detection and reaction to presence with a robust mitigation of, like I've said before, proteins, compounds, microbes, but also little micro RNAs that'll just suppress gene expression. Um, on the right, we have a diagram that shows sort of uh, as a model um, how aphids sort of uh, are recognized by the plant. So, you know, various parts of their bodies will even have little structures that plants have receptors for, or they have receptors for these um, proteins and enzymes that they're producing. Even though some of them are meant to suppress the immune system, some of those can still be basically recognized. And in a resistant plant, they're recognized, and then a defense response occurs. In a susceptible plant, the factor that we're talking about, whatever it might be, is not affected or not recognized. And so um, a, a immune response just doesn't happen, right? So that's kind of the main difference between a plant that is like resistant versus susceptible. Uh, we have these three terms here, anti-xenosis, antibiosis, and tolerance. I thought I'd go over them uh, very briefly because when we talk about plant resistance to aphids and other insects for that matter, um, the concept of resistance is sort of um, complicated, or at the very least, it's sort of a spectrum. So at the very bottom, we have tolerance, which is sort of a complex of genetic traits that allow plants to endure or recover from aphid damage without affecting the pest growth or, or survival. So the aphids are actually able to feed and reproduce fine, but the plant is also able to tolerate that presence, essentially. It's able to mitigate uh, sort of negative effects of the uh, presence of the organism. It doesn't get rid of the organism, but it's able to tolerate it. Um, a higher stage would be something like antibiosis, which is basically when various factors like morphology and chemical structures and things that the plant produces will affect the uh, aphids development um, by uh, using the host as food. And then antizoonosis is kind of a more advanced version of that where these effects are basically more intense and they might even lead to actual rejection of the host outright, which is very different from the other two that we're talking about. And one of those examples, uh, just in case anyone was curious, very, very common one is this MIF1 protein. Uh, basically, since plant cells and animal cells you can think of are fundamentally very similar. A lot of their um, structures and things are very similar, their processes. Um, so these MIF proteins were produced by aphids uh, to defend themselves actually as an immune response agent. Essentially, um, a parasitoid wasp, for example, or some other parasite will get into the aphid body and these MIF-1 proteins create a uh, cytokine um, reaction and that essentially suppresses or um, uh, sort of chaotically interferes with the development of like a parasitoid wasp larva or something and kills it. Um, so in that way, it's very beneficial, maybe not for the individual that might still die, but for the colony as a whole. Um, so what happened is that a long time ago, these MIF proteins ended up getting used to be disruptive to the plant cells. And indeed, for a lot of aphids, these proteins, um, and others like it are very important for aphid colonization. 
because what they do is they essentially, um, like I said earlier, they sort of suppress and um, disallow for the plant cells to even produce the sort of defensive compounds and reactions that a plant requires to have an effective resistance and possibly even, like I said earlier, uh, um, an anti-zeonotic effect. So something that was that's very, very severe. They can't do that. Uh, when these proteins are in play. So why does this matter? Um, essentially, rice root aphid populations uh, specialized for cannabis may exist now or in the future. Uh, rice root aphid is a long-time pest. It's been found on many, many, many kinds of plants. And if you'd like to know some examples of that, we'll go over them here. But I also have a YouTube video called uh, Rice Root Aphid uh, Pest Primer. That you can check out that goes over some of those um, plants and what they look like if you're trying to find out what's on your own property. Uh, but because it's a long time pest, they've been exposed to things like pesticides and uh, various cultivars of plants. And essentially, it's possible that some of the exposure to some of these things have caused uh, sort of an evolutionary response. And uh, some of these rice root aphids might develop resistances easier even to botanical chemistries that we use. Uh, a lot of the harsher chemistries that people use shouldn't be used on cannabis anyways, but um, you know, this is just something that bears repeating because it's an effect that might have affected the rice root aphids that we're all dealing with now. And uh, finally, rice root aphids have a wide host range. They feed on dozens of plants of various families that are not very closely related to each other. So this implies that you know, if those slides just were any indication that these rice root aphids have a very robust host defense countermeasure. So that means that essentially they're very good at defeating the immune systems of many different kinds of plants, cannabis included. And so it makes their threat level kind of higher. And just another thing that you should consider uh, when it comes to dealing with rice root aphids, you shouldn't take them very lightly. Um, they are very good at what they do here. And I have some highlighted parts of this um, incredibly good research report for anyone who's interested in reading more called Aphids in Focus, Unraveling Their Complex Ecology and Evolution Using Genetic and Molecular Approaches. So they found that essentially aphids, um, they basically, they clone themselves, they radiate out, many populations die and equal, basically they equalize with their various environments. And then those populations will end up like I was saying earlier, specializing and uh, getting better at adapting to certain plants, um, you know, in, in their range. So even though they look exactly the same as others that are basically identical uh, morphologically, their internal genetic changes uh, will be different. You know, we can see this in research. And of course, um, no topic about aphid bricks or <laughs> aphid uh, nutrition and ability would be uh, complete without talking about their ability to feed on sugars or, in other words, um, high Brix plants. So Brix isn't just sugar, of course, but it is other um, uh, constituents in the phloem. Uh, but some people have said that the sugars in plants are directly toxic um, to, uh, to aphids and particularly uh, that they can shrivel because the sugar pressure, the sugar content is so high. Now that would cause a lot of osmotic pressure, but as you can see in these diagrams uh, and this um, excerpt, uh, in this research report from 1997, they took a look at the P aphid and they found that um, as they increase the moles of sugar or the fractions of moles, um, which is the concentration by mass, uh, they increased it quite, a, quite high, in fact, higher than you would see in um, plants naturally, up to one mole, which is massive. Um, it's like 300 plus grams of sugar per liter. And uh, they had no problem dealing with it. Um, and that's because they have various uh, enzymes that break down uh, plant sugars, particularly sucrose, like sucrases, but also um, other enzymes as well. So aphids, if you are not sure, they definitely are good at feeding on plants with high sugar content. Um, and certainly they have the uh, physiology equipment in order to do so. Yeah, so here, one mole of sucrose is 342 grams of sucrose per 1,000 grams of water. Um, so they were able to feed on 34.2 bricks, which is pretty egregious. So it's definitely not toxic to them.
Finally, rice root aphids. So rice root aphids, like I said before, they have kind of a, a two-way uh, path for their life cycle. Um, they'll go on to their herbaceous plants in spring and summer, and they'll go on to woodier plants, which I would consider cannabis to be that a sort of woodier plant uh, type. But interestingly, although rice root aphids hail from Eastern Asia, and I think particularly possibly Japan, or at least the Eastern part of um, uh, the coast of Eurasia, um, that sort of area is considered their kind of native origin. Um, and in those areas, especially in Japan, they do end up having like a life cycle where they reproduce and, and lay eggs. However, here in, uh, in the West, in Europe, and also um, USA, North America, and um, other places, they tend to just not produce eggs a lot of the time. Uh, not, not always, but a lot of the time you might not even see eggs. So if you're looking for rice root aphid eggs, you may not find any in a cannabis cultivation in like North America or Europe. Um, so some of the plants that they feed on, so if, you know, like uh, if you're trying to look for potential vectors that are on your property, uh, you should look at grasses that are pretty common, like rye, barley, wheat, of course, rice. Um, they also feed on aeroids. If you know somebody who are, who's growing a lot of house plants, they might be able to help you out with that um, and, and looking for some of the examples there. You know, uh, Asteraceae, like daisies and sunflowers and many other plants like them. Um, Ranunculus, uh, Ranunculaceae, so like buttercups and that kind of a thing. They also have been found on peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, and other sorts of plants like that. And there's many others too that you can take a look at. And these uh, research reports on the bottom left are great sources uh, for that information. Woody plants that they're associated with, uh, prunus species in particular. So peach and cherry and almonds are very common. So if you live near any orchards, definitely a thing to consider. If you have any of these plants, you should be um, scouting them for potential rice root aphid infestation. They also feed on apples and crab apples, uh, on quince, like flowering quince, uh, pears, jet bead, and also on white beam or rowan plants as well, which are pretty common. Um, there are also some closely related species uh, that may actually, for all we know, they might actually infest cannabis, but we don't know because they look very similar. And there's not a whole lot of documentation um, about rice root aphids and other uh, pest species on cannabis in particular. But in case you're curious, uh, it may come up that we find that um, water lily aphids or corn aphids or bird chariot aphids or apple grass aphids, which are all in the same genus. So they're all very closely related uh, at a genetic level. Um, and also they have some overlaps in hosts too. So you might also find, um, you know, a sister species that actually isn't going to attack your cannabis potentially. So that's just something to keep in mind again when you're growing at home or even in a commercial setting. They're also known to vector viruses here. Uh, barley yellow dwarf virus, cereal yellow dwarf virus, maize mosaic virus, and sugarcane mosaic virus uh, are all known. But uh, cucumber mosaic virus, I want to give particular credence to because um, I think this is actually one of the examples of a virus that is in the cannabis virome and does infect cannabis. So um, it's not very well understood, uh, the epidemiology, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if rice root aphid is actually a vector. More information is necessary to kind of understand if this is even true and to what degree this is true. So we should look for peer-reviewed research and empirical research that backs that up, but um, presumably uh, that is a potential um, a virus vector and a virus for cannabis. And I also want to go over the bionomics of the rice root aphids. So generally at um, certain temperatures, insects will have different developmental times. Um, rice root aphid will develop uh, around 20 to almost 21 days at a temperature of like 10 degrees Celsius, but like four and a half days to adulthood in like 30 degrees Celsius, for example. So that's a major swing. So the environment in which you're growing your plants definitely has an effect not only on their development, but also the rice root aphid. Um, the adult longevity is about 29 uh, days at 10 and nine days at 30. And the amount of nymphs that they produce uh, like about 63 they can produce, like this is talking about one aphid, uh, 63 uh, at 20 degrees Celsius and 31 at 30 degrees Celsius. So you see that it goes down instead of going up. 
And that's because um, although there's a sweet spot for temperature, if that temperature goes too high, um, that can cause negative effects. Just like we get, you know, too, um, you know, too heated, and uh, uh, you know, it can cause problems for us physiologically. We can overheat, and the same is true for aphids. Um, so in, in that way, sometimes increasing your temperature can be a stressor, and also you can apply other stressors as well to have like a multi-layered approach for your integrated pest management, uh, which really segues well into this sort of nymphal temperature limit. It doesn't mean that if you have your, uh, you know, relative temperature at 35 degrees that they're all going to die hundred percent. But what this means is that um, they start to reach this sort of problem with their molting and other sorts of things as they develop from small little nymphs to larger uh, forms and eventually an adult. Um, that process is very taxing and a lot of insects just, just, they just die from it. They just don't come to, to adulthood because of, you know, any number of complications. And so as the temperature really increases um, or decreases quite a bit, uh, you run into some physiological problems there. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, their optimum temperature seems to be about 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. And uh, I'm remiss I didn't put a uh, Fahrenheit in there, and I've switched my brain to Celsius in some ways, and uh, I don't have a, a proper, uh, perfect calculation, but I'm sure somebody in chat would be happy to translate. Oh, and I'll go over these two. These are ecological, but population doubling time is the time that it takes for a, call, a population to double, right? So that's one and a half days at uh, optimal conditions uh, from the research report that this comes from. Uh, their mean generation time, which means the amount of time it takes to create a new generation, is about nine days, which is pretty fast, right? Um, and they're they're known globally, so they're not just found in North America or Europe or or Asia, um, and they're they're found in temperate, subtropical, and tropical environments. So in those temperate environments, they're more likely to have this sort of um, seasonal change in their life cycle where they produce nymphs that become adults that have no wings. And then over time, when the seasons change, some of those adults with no wings will turn into or produce rather adults that do have wings. Those winged adults will move to other plants uh, where they will produce new colonies, either because their original col colony is um, sort of too crowded or because the seasons have changed and they are now going to produce eggs or rather they'll produce um, non-winged adults that will then produce eggs. It's a very complicated process, to be honest. And a lot of things can affect which form gets produced. Identification is very important with the rice root aphid. Um, I have received thousands at this point um, of requests of people asking me what a rice root aphid looks like or if something that they're seeing is a rice root aphid. Um, so it's important to go over what they look like and some of the um, common things that do look like them. So on the upper left here, we have a fungus gnat on a sticky card. You can clearly see that they have two wings, just two wings. Um, so that right away tells you that they're very different. A lot of insects, their technical, like their order level names and uh, such are um, based on their wings because wings are very important for their evolution. So that's why that is the way that it is. So you can usually tell very generalized characteristics simply by looking at the wings of an insect um, and then being familiar with what that tells you about the, the group. So in the, in the middle here, we have the bottom, the ventral side of a rice root aphid. You can kind of see these two structures uh, near the wings. Those are called cornicles or siphuncles, and it's unique to aphids to have these. Um, there are other insects that might even have little claspers or um, maybe ovipositors and things that can look very similar. But these cornicles produce defense compounds or alarm pheromones, potentially, depending on the species. And that's what their function is. They do not produce honeydew. Honeydew comes from uh, the gut. So it's literally their excrement. It's their waste. That is not produced by the, the cornicles. But um, you'll see that Aphids tend to have this sort of bulbous, almost teardrop-shaped body. A lot of aphids have a similar body. So you might find an aphid uh, that, that is an aphid, but it might also look very similar to a rice root aphid. Rice root aphids tend to have, uh, they can be various colors, but they tend to be black, orange, um, green sometimes. But they usually have a little reddish coloration 
at the hind section of their body. And we're, we're going to go over some video footage I've taken of aphids uh, throughout my client work um, that will kind of show what I'm talking about when I say they have this sort of reddish hue on their bodies, which can really lead to a good identification diagnostic because most aphids do not have this sort of characteristic. On the bottom, we have uh, predatory mites. Uh, they're kind of blurry here, but you can kind of see that um, they do kind of look like an aphid if you squint and maybe reverse the image a little bit. Uh, very commonly, I'm asked about them because they they live in the soil, and rice root aphids will um, exist on the roots of plants, and then they'll travel up the plant into the foliage. So uh, people often become confused because of that. So aphid morphology, a head plus antennae, a stylet, or sometimes what's called a rostrum, which is a piercing mouth part. They have a thorax, which has six legs attached to it, which you can see in this picture. Uh, and they have four wings total. They have two full-size wings and two half-size wings. Uh, they have a bulbous abdomen, and they have the two cornicles. And they could be green, orange, or black, generally. Their size is important, too. They're about 1.4 to 2.4 millimeters long. And uh, like I said, they have this red abdomen at the bottom. Flies, for example, have a proboscis. They have this sort of sponging mouth part, which you can kind of see a difference if you take a look with a microscope. They do have six legs as well. They have two wings. Um, and they have sort of a thin body. Flies, especially um, cyarids and fungus gnat-like flies and midges, they tend to have a very dainty body. And they tend to run very fast along the... Um, the soil or whatever substrate you have. Whereas aphids kind of have, they can run kind of fast, um, but they kind of lumber. They kind of are a little bit more clumsy in their movement. And um, that's why I think this video footage I'll show you is so important because it's easy to see a picture, but it's a lot more difficult to sort of discern without like a visual that you're more realistically going to encounter. And then there's mites. Mites are very much smaller than rice root aphids. Certainly they're nymphs, the rice root aphid nymphs will also be small when they start out, um, but they're also not going to be moving nearly as fast as uh, various predatory mites will as well. And um, if you do get a very close uh, picture or you happen to catch one or have one, find one dead um, along your uh, leaf litter or whatever, then you'll find that they actually don't even have the right number of legs. Uh, mites, when they're young, a lot of times they have six legs like an insect, but when they become an adult, they gain two other legs and they have their uh, full repertoire of eight legs. And um, we'll probably talk about this uh, next session, uh, but uh, as you can see here, this is forward on cannabis, the cannabis aphid. Um, they look very different from the rice root aphid. They have, the, you kind of see these vertical lines almost on the, um, uh, on the body on the upper right here, um, uh, microscopic photograph. Uh, but you can see that they have like a pale whitish or greenish coloration, whereas rice root aphids uh, tend to not have anything kind of approaching this sort of um, light color. So that's one way you can tell cannabis aphids from um, rice root aphids, for example. So here's a, a predatory mite uh, moving along. This was a um, Gerbera flower, actually. Um, but uh, yeah, they're very, very tiny and they move very um, sort of uh, intricately and methodically. Um, I would not expect aphids to have this kind of articulation uh, when moving and certainly they're way too small to be it. Uh, but that's just, just an example for people who haven't seen predatory mites really up close and personal. And they might encounter this if they're buying a microscope for the first time or they're trying to look in their soil for predatory mites and what they might look like. Um, you know, this is just a, a, an interesting example. So this was actually a Swirsky mite. Here we have um, a colony of rice root aphids on some cannabis roots. Uh, you can kind of see that some of these aphids have like a green color, but then at the bottom of their body, kind of in the abdomen section, it turns like an orangish and reddish coloration. I found that um, if you aggress aphids with like a, chemical agent like pyrethrin or azadiractin that really stresses them out. Um, and I think that they, I've observed the colors changed, but I don't know for sure why this is, but I feel like it coincided with some of the treatment regimens that I was using at the time. 
And if you want more of this footage, you can find it on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol. I have several videos about rice root aphids in particular. And uh, this video excerpt is actually from one that's like 30 minutes of rice root aphids with um, information and observational footage, as well as what they look like when you kill them with a uh, fungal parasite, which we'll go over as well. So here you can see this is a particularly colonized root ball. Um, and imagine, remember what I said earlier about aphids and their ability to suppress plant immune systems. Now, you might see this little gray insect here. This is a springtail, actually, not an aphid, but another uh, organism that aphids often are confused with. Um, so you can kind of see how quick and nimble that uh, springtails are, rather than the very um, sort of slow and uh, almost turtle-like aphids in comparison. Uh, but aphids are constantly suppressing the local and general immune system of plants. So um, this is a very stressed out plant for sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see that they tend to congregate at root tips and um, along the, the roots, certainly wherever they can. This is also another reason why rice root aphids aren't very negatively affected by a lot of biocontrol agents because rice root aphids that establish well, if they only establish in the foliage, then it's fine. It's no problem. They're like most aphids. But if they actually are able to establish into the roots, um, unless you have something like a Bouveria bassiana or Isaria fumosaurusia, which are fungal parasites that will get into the soil and they will colonize aphid bodies and then move to the other aphid bodies. Um, a gruesome way to go, but certainly an effective one. Uh, if you have that situation, then that's fine. But various other biocontrols, like insects, for example, they aren't very, um, they, they don't tend to go deep enough into the substrate to be super effective. Now, certainly they'll go and they'll attack things and harass things that are coming out of the soil, like this adult, which has been um, uh, sort of damaged. Uh, I actually don't remember the context for why it was, but you can kind of see one that has uh, a more pristine sort of wing um, development. And again, you can kind of see that they're sort of blackish in coloration. A lot of the winged forms that I found were um, just such a color with a little bit of green, as you can see in the abdomen here. Um, so they'll come out of the soil um, and then they'll go into the foliage and then they'll fly to a new plant. And like I said, they can, they can go pretty fast. They can, they can, um, they can get along, but not nearly the level of speed that you'll see with like a fungus gnat, um, which I have a pest primer video about too on my channel if you want to take a look, but um, they are kind of a lumbering sort of insect. Here's uh, rice root aphids that are staging on the bottom of a cannabis trunk. Uh, so you can see that there, there's forms that are winged and also forms that are not winged and they're just kind of feeding on the, the, uh, the trunk here. But eventually, uh, they go to move into the foliage. It's like this. So that's an alate rice root aphid. So the alates have wings. Um, the aptera, the atera have no ring wings, and that's the technical term for those two forms. Certainly, uh, it's not restricted that only the winged forms will go into the foliage. Here you can see a rice root aphid uh, female moving up into the foliage um, to get a better view, I guess. Maybe some, uh, maybe some better nutritional um, differences in the leaves versus the roots. And a lot of this bionomics data is the same as what I said before, uh, but I will, I will say that uh, it's an interesting slide. And since we're doing this through video, people can just pause it and take a look. But um, a lot of that information is from the, the excerpt they had before, but you'll notice that uh, it's, it's um, delineated so you can see how long uh, they are at each stage or how long each stage takes uh, for people who are sort of metrics oriented or trying to figure out like the scheduling and logistics of the nitty gritty of their treatment regimen. Some of this information can be pretty useful, uh, especially the 28% developmental mortality uh, when we're talking about fecundity of females. Not every uh, uh, you know, progeny succeeds to adulthood, and certainly not every single one um, 
uh, survives the birthing process, but a, a lot of them do, certainly enough of them. So there are a few things that go uh, that rice food aphids actually uh, are affected by. In my experience, biological control agents like lacewing larvae, hoverfly larvae, parasitoid wasps, and the very new whirligig mites uh, are very effective. Um, Buvaria bassiana and Isaria fumus ursia are fungi. They're also very effective, and I often like to use uh, sort of a multi-domain approach where we'll use uh, uh, sort of a botanical insecticide, like one of these chemical agents like pyrethrin or as a direct into the roots um, at the right rate. And then we will follow up with or use at the same time in tandem uh, blueberry bassiana or something to the, to, the, to the roots. And that tends to be a really good one-two punch. But uh, you can also apply some of these to the foliage as well. Wettable sulfur as well, but uh, don't use it in the flower for obvious reasons. Um, you will not have great bud afterwards. Um, you can also use physical agents of control. Things like if you're growing inside, having an environmental shelter that's very well protected is very useful. Um, you can also um, intensify that with a mesh screen, which I like to use for other pests as well. Uh, but it could perhaps cut down on the chances of that um, aphid actually landing on your plant. And this is especially true if you're growing in an exposed environment rather than a sheltered environment. And glue traps are useful, uh, especially if you're applying them to the trunk, because that is how aphids will naturally go up the plant. And you can catch quite a bit by doing so. Um, you can also use cultural agents, which are kind of how you do things, essentially. I often say that cultural agents are some of the best agents um, when it comes to control because they usually cost nothing and they're all about your process. So if you quarantine cuttings, that's incredibly beneficial and useful, not just for rice root aphids, but especially rice root aphids go uh, to new grows through cuttings very commonly because they require living plant tissue to feed and they're very cryptic. So it can be easy for somebody, even somebody who's earnestly trying to control them to apply some sort of a compound like pyrethrin and visually everything looks fine. But uh, in between the substrate or whatever, there's this little nestled uh, aphid that escaped um, control, which is why coverage um, of chemical agents is so important when you're using a responsible uh, type of agent even, um, all the more so because a lot of the noxious compounds are use are effective rather because they are systemic. But uh, again, I don't recommend those. Uh, and also crop scouting. If you don't actually uh, go out and take a look at your plants, um, it's easier to do, of course, with smaller amounts of plants. But as the amount of plants that you have grows larger and larger, uh, this becomes more and more important because it's very easy for a population to kind of radically get out of control if you're not uh, vigilant. Some of these biocontrols I have videos of. Um, I don't actually want to see the whole video but I do want to show you what these hoverflies look like. Here's a hoverfly larva feeding on aphids. Uh, this is on a dandelion leaf. Uh, so it's not really a cannabis aphid or anything like that. But um, if you've seen these little caterpillar looking things around aphids, um, this is what you're, this is what these are. These are not caterpillars. These are actually fly larvae. And uh, as you can kind of see here, you can see this little egg. You see these white eggs along with your aphids, along with these caterpillar looking things, don't kill them. Again, you want to facilitate these because these larvae will eat um, your aphid colony. And uh, yeah, this is how they kind of move. They have this sort of like casting behavior, which is also very different from like a caterpillar. Yeah, so he's searching and then they pull their body up again, and then they adhere themselves to the, the floor, and then they do it again, and they repeat this process, and that's how hoverflies hunt for their uh, prey. Um, parasitoid wasps are pretty interesting. A lot of them are commercially available. Hoverfly larvae less so, at least in North America, but you can also find hoverflies um, all across uh, North America and Europe and other parts of the world for that matter. And uh, here's a parasitoid wasps going over some um, aphids in a colony. 
it's searching for the right one. And what it'll do is it'll take its uh, abdomen and it will puncture the body of the aphid and uh, deposit an egg. That egg will turn to a larva, which eats the insides of the aphid. And then over time, uh, that larva will develop and then an adult will come out. And you can kind of see these aphid mummies when they are, um, uh, when they've uh, become a husk uh, very commonly. You can kind of see one here in the, in the, um, the video. It's in the kind of the center that's become very bloated and gray. And here we have a green lacewing larva. This is what they look like. Very different from lacewing adults. In fact, they're a very primitive um, kind of a group as far as insects are concerned. But yeah, a lot of people have not actually seen them up close or what they kind of look like. And so, and a lot of them, you know, there's commercially available larvae, but they also exist in nature. So you might actually encounter them, especially if you're growing outside. There's actually a good example of a mummified uh, aphid in this particular footage, which was not caused by the lacewing. That was caused by the parasitoid wasp that was there before it. They've got these large uh, mandibles and the lacewing larva will go around. It'll not just feed on aphids, it'll feed on many other things, um, but they're, uh, they're very deft predators. Yeah, here's one uh, trying to uh, feed on a on a mummified aphid, but it was uh, uh, not suitable, <laughs> not a suitable host. <laughs> so that's what those look like. And then uh, for chemical treatment, for example, this is um, a photo credit to my friend Christian Kudi, who at a facility uh, was applying uh, rice root, uh, treatment to rice root aphids here. And uh, it was very effective to sort of bag them and then uh, apply their uh, botanical insecticide. And, um, and it also disallowed the aphids to escape. Uh, again, I want to reiterate that coverage is so very crucial and important um, to uh, effective uh, control and treatment uh, when you're using these chemistries. And uh, in many cases, they're, they're pretty important, and you have to be very aggressive uh, with their application. You can't just do it once or twice. A lot of times, you have to do it multiple times, which can be very costly, especially at the commercial level. And that's my presentation. Uh, this is the same information from the last presentation. I haven't changed anything, really. Uh, but if again, if you're interested in uh, professional work, you can find me on zenthanol.com. You can also find me on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, as well as on Twitter and Instagram at Sync Angel, which is where I post a lot of my educational content, especially on Instagram. A lot of people in the chat probably know me from there. And uh, if you're interested in some of my publications, I was contributing um, author to a couple of new books that came out about um, uh, organic farming and also uh, uh, sort of um, plant health in general. So this one was Arthropod Pests of Cannabis Sativa in the United States of America, Integrated Pest Management of or Against, and also Viral Diseases of Hemp, Cannabis Sativa. So uh, those were two very fun things to contribute to. And I was also interviewed by uh, Nippon Television about uh, cannabis, which I thought was very interesting and I uh, heartily support. And that's it. Excellent. Excellent, Matthew. Thank you very much. I know people in chat were, were listening and watching along. Uh, you know, some of the, these are the things nightmares are made of with all the, uh, with the videos. But I think that provides, uh, you know, a very important visual aspect to the information that people are giving out today. Again, being a very visual person um, and how common or well, how similar they look at just surface level to fungus gnats. I almost say like, you know, fungus gnats are like the insect world's version of cow mag for the nutrient world. Everybody's <laughs> like, they're fungus gnats, but they're, this, you know, really shows a better identification. There could be so much more to it and you might be missing it. So I saw that definitely verbalized in there. Yeah, they're so common, uh, not just rice root aphids, but like you say, fungus gnats. So, um, you know, definitely a, a pest we'll have to talk about for sure. 
Yeah, and 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 I did. We did get some questions um, along the way. I've wrote down some of my own. Uh, everybody in chat, you know, we have a captive audience with Mr. Matthew Gates right now. So if you have any questions with the right roost aphids pop them into chat we'll make sure to get them up there and get them answered um and a couple that came in um i'll just go reverse order that i wrote them down uh, a question from nolly grows uh was that some of the chemicals that you had mentioned um for treating them are harder to get in canada and he was curious about insecticidal soap if that was a, a viable option and an effective option uh, it can be, certainly. The issue with that is that uh, usually you can't apply that to the roots, at least in my experience. So okay. um, it's kind of the main, that's what makes rice root aphids so dang difficult, is that you have to treat the foliar, the phylosphere, and the rhizosphere. And if you only treat the, the foliage, you're not going to treat the sort of the heart of the colony, so to speak. Uh, but there, it's very effective, foliage, and uh, in veg in particular. Okay. Now, now that just makes me think, uh, you know, it'd probably be a lot easier to drench my roots if I had a three gallon pot compared to like a four by four living soil bed. Um, would just beneficials be the option in a four by four bed? Uh, nobody's going to be soaking that. Yeah. So that, um, that does, you know, that does kind of, uh, add a complication, like sort of in a natural environment, if you're just if you're just cultivating in sown uh, ground, for example, mm -hmm. you know the treatments for that are going to be limited. Um, and uh, you know, in a sort of a field set scenario, even something that's even grander than that, um, you know, it's going to be very challenging, I think, for people to find um, sort of effective controls. But at a more home grow setting, uh, you can still use things like um, Bouveria bassiana, and I find that that is very effective and. Like you kind of saw in the video, um, a little tidbit anyways, um, you know, they get mycosized. So the mm -hmm. fungus enters into the body um, and eats them and then sporulates and uh, that hyphae sort of grows to the next colony member, which is probably very close by. So it's very effective for that reason. Uh, so I recommend that people utilize that if they can and sort of establish it in their uh, in their soil. Okay. And, and kind of on the same tip too, of just the, the preventative chemicals or solutions we could use, uh, would you recommend, what would you recommend for a clone dunk uh, when starting fresh from infected plants? Okay. So you know, you got it. What are you doing to not pass it on? Right. Very good. So um, the first thing you do is you stop giving your plants to other people, even though if you're really sure that you probably got everything, uh, you know, you should take another look at them and be very vigilant uh, until you're absolutely sure, because um, a lot of people I know have been very sure uh, and have still sent them to other people like friends and, and clients. So, um, you, know, you just got to be careful. Uh, but for applications, pyrethrin uh, works really well. Wettable sulfur, like I said earlier, can work really well. Um, if you don't, you know, if you do the roots and the, the foliage, you know, the small clones, I know people, um, who will use uh, sulfur, uh, in that way. Uh, but I've, in my experience, sometimes that has caused a little bit of root burn. So I would be very careful and, um, uh, maybe apply something a little bit less harsh, um, than that. Uh, but I do find that if you apply like a, a low, Low level of like, like I said, like a pyrethrin as a directin that can be uh, pretty effective. Uh, and again, like you said, some of these compounds are not easy to get in other parts of the world. Um, certainly, I've had people from uh, Chile or Argentina um, uh, or Spain, for that matter, that come to my mind where these products are not uh, easy to get. So, if we have anyone um, watching from there, you know, that might be something to sort of consider. Okay. And, and real quick, pyrethrin, pyrethrum, one mm -hmm. is naturally derived, the other is synthetic, or is, what, one of them is okay, the other isn't, right? Yeah. So pyrethrin, uh, so pyrethrum is a synthetic pyrethrin. Okay. Um, a pyrethroid, oid means it's like the thing. So, hmm. um, so pyrethroid is something that is like the pyreth in the pyrethrin group. So it's very complicated. As I knew this question would come up. So pyrethrin is a botanically derived compound. I mean, it doesn't have to be. You can synthesize that too. But originally, this is a botanical compound. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. And it's not systemic, whereas the other one, pyrethrum, is systemic. It will translocate into the tissues. It will move up and down uh, the tissues. Okay. And therein lies the problem of why it's bad, why we don't want it in our cannabis plant. But those those words are so, you know, um, sometimes just accidentally interchanged in conversation because they're just one little syllable difference. Absolutely. Yes. I definitely agree. Good question. Yeah. And, and, and I do enjoy your answer, too, of the clones, of how to prevent it from spreading. Uh, stop giving out those clones. I enjoy that answer because most of well, I would say at least probably 99% of the clones I give out are to people who it's probably the first time they've ever taken clones. They're just starting out or they're getting into it. And that is always what I say. I'm like, I'm going to tell you that these are clean and they don't have anything. Assume that they do because everybody's going to tell you that they don't. And that is the absolute truth. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because it gives me a chance. Um, they've always been clean. Maybe I missed yeah. something. I never have, never heard a complaint. But again, assume that it does have the problem. I totally agree with that. And uh, I know that it's also, it can be a lot to ask somebody to like develop a quarantine space. And they might have ideas about that, about what that entails and right. something even as simple as just a separation like we're talking about something with a spectrum of of um executions but um you don't have to have like a hermetically sealed off laboratory you know <laughs> space uh you know if you don't have access to that even just separating them with like a wall or some sort of physical barrier mm -hmm. or like a netting um you know can be very helpful while you're evaluating to see if it really is because you know it's not that people are being duplicitous rather a lot of times it's just hard to see them, you know, and that's how they're so good at what they do. Exactly. They're, they are ninjas. Um, and we had another question from super blank in the chat. Um, and it really was super blank. I'm not substituting it for a bad word. Um, so super <laughs> blank said, uh, or it was just curious about the prime geographical areas or environmental conditions. I know you mentioned North America and Europe. Um, but do they have a, a preferred geographical region or climate? I would say um, that that's probably their origin zone, uh, if only for the fact that I think, if I can't remember correctly, I feel like that's also the only place where males have been observed. It doesn't mean that they don't <laughs> exist elsewhere, but um, a, lot, a lot of aphids are like this. So I say that because it means that they're probably sexually reproducing, or at the very least they're producing eggs and uh, that can uh, help them over winter um, and they can all and with the sexual reproduction that can help them sort of pass on this hybridization of, of genes that can make them more um, you know virile essentially um, so i would say probably eastern asia but on top of that anywhere that's tropical or subtropical they tend to do really well uh, so much so they don't even have to make the sexual forms hmm. so or the eggs for that matter clonal form yeah i love that um you mentioned you know the clonal form that was one of the questions i had written down you actually did a great job of uh addressing all of the questions by the end with with the slides um but reproduction life cycle that's very important to know um because you know if you just kill what you see now there's still eggs or clones or nips so something coming up next and just everybody who's watching this far if you missed it i wrote it down it's at 44 minutes in there's a slide and it has the uh complete life cycle and the speed hugely beneficial so i just wanted to point that one out again for everybody listening maybe you missed it the first time because you were watching the video it's oh, cool um and, and another question uh potent Ponix jumped in uh he had some good things to add and he was curious about um you know what can they vector and he was kind of specifically curious about um bacterial blights uh, mm. if if that makes sense it's it's that's above my pay grade <laughs> i feel like we've talked about this before i'm i'm open to uh being told again if i'm remembering wrong but um I don't know if they're a vector for, for that in particular. Aphids tend to be really competent vectors of viruses. Um, and like I mentioned, they can even pick up uh, secondary endosymbionts, specifically uh, bacteria, from uh, their environment, from the plants they feed on and things. So um, I feel like that's probably possible. But uh, I don't know necessarily exactly for 
um, any bacteria that cause a blight, like uh, on cannabis or anything. But okay. um, if he has any information on that, or if anyone else does, you know, this is sort of burgeoning. So you know, share this information with other people if you can, uh, including myself. <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 you know, you had mentioned viruses and, you know, virus vectoring, um, you know, early on in my growing experience, I had, um, thrips and I didn't really see much damage to the plants. I didn't take care of them like I should have. It never became a, you know, critical mass problem. Um, but again, I, I, I kind of looked at the plants and didn't see damage. So I wasn't worried. I wasn't aware at that point of my growing uh, of uh, vectoring. So they did eventually catch something that causes some stunting anyhow. Um, but I did make a note here. You, you were talking about, you know, they're, they're great at spreading the viruses or vectoring them, but you're not going to notice much plant damage. Is that kind of true? Yeah. They're okay. um, like, like little hypodermic needles. They're stylets. Um, and then their mandibles, you know, sort of evert out of that. So uh, they're, they're, you won't see like wounds like you will see for um, spider mites um, right, right. or thrips, like you mentioned, um, which both have like a stylet like mouth part. Um, but aphids are, that's why they're so good at doing that. Um, but the real damage is invisible. The real damage will be um, stunting. In some cases, I've seen heavily infested plants um, become sort of chlorotic. And um, I don't always see this. Sometimes I've seen plants with like hundreds of aphids in the root system mm -hmm. and the plants are vibrant and green. <laughs> um, and sometimes I've seen them look like they're senescing early okay. because of it. So uh, definitely it seems to be um, complicated. Yeah. And, and, you know, thank you again for reiterating that because I just wanted to, you know, highlight that for people who might be uh in my situation like yeah the plant's not dying i'll be fine because i didn't want to spray anything or whatever so all right mm -hmm. there's that uh, but another part to that you did mention that um even after they are gone or you know eradicated they can have long lasting effects on the plant including nutrient uptake so is that something that may present itself uh, like a lockout situation or would it look like a deficiency in a particular mineral i feel like it would it would be like um so mainly what i'm talking about is uh how they affect the immune system of the plant and uh, granted a lot of from and again a lot of this research is sort of um sort of new uh but from what we can tell you know certainly some of those these effects are temporary okay. uh, but some of the effects might just be really long lasting but again not permanent um, some of the more permanent things are like the callus. Uh, how that would look essentially is that uh, maybe the plant would be a little bit stunted or rather it wouldn't, it wouldn't look like anything. It would more so just be that the plant is going to be more susceptible to other things within that time frame, and depending on what they're suppressing and if they're actively feeding on the plant or if they've all been eradicated already and then something else comes in, you know, the plant uh, immune system primes to the things it's been affected by and uh sort of like um and also the things it, it associates with like a symbiosis like we said in the um first presentation about what a pest is mm -hmm. so good guys affect the immune system bad guys affect the immune system um sometimes good guys can affect the immune system that helps bad guys uh so and the vice versa so i think that would be the main effect is um your plant's response to stressors like heat and um pests Okay. And, and yeah, to that point, you, you, you know, you were talking about the plant resistance. It's all based upon like detection and reaction, uh, to build up a defense to these. And there's products like, I think it's Kytosan. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, uh, it's almost like a, a hormone or something that you, you apply to the plant and it feels like it's under attack. So it starts to build these defenses early. Yeah. Uh, okay. So is that, something that might help uh or it could be incorporated into a ip regiment if you've had these before you're worried about them again maybe try to prime the plant for something like that would that work i think i think it would work but um like uh i want to be that's why i bring this up actually i'm glad you brought this up as well is that um these products 
when they work, they don't work by like, um, that's why I kind of brought up the, the point about like tolerance versus like uh, xenobiosis, for example, like these two, you know, they're all ha aspects of resistance, but um, even these products like Kytosan, other ones that um, like they might have a chitin, you know, that like the plant will recognize as a, what we call a PAMP, um, you know, like a pathogen associated molecular pattern okay. or a HAMP or herbivore associated molecular pattern. So these are molecules that the plants have associated with certain problems. And so it primes the immune system. So when they work, they work by keeping the plants immune system prime. How they don't work is by like being toxic to the uh, insect or whatever other pest we're talking about. Um, and if you use them in a certain way and you prime the immune system towards one path, of the you know certain paths of the immune system like jasmine acid pathway or salicylic acid pathway or ethylene or whatever these different pathways can interact with each other and 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 negatively affect each other okay so so in some cases they might not work in a in a spectacular way but you wouldn't be able to tell until uh, the pests are upon you so yeah. I, i'm not against them or anything Okay. We had a, a comment here. Eric Eating was just chiming in too, kind of to my question. Uh, his experience was it looks like they have low calcium, magnesium, and or potassium ended up being root aphids. Now, if I'm in a system like, let's say I'm in cocoa or something where you get a lot of runoff, if I'm constantly getting runoff, uh, I have seen little things in my runoff before. Would we see root rice root aphids uh in the runoff can imagining they were in a critical number to where you know the population is plentiful to wash out i've definitely seen that definitely okay. okay so that's that's always an interesting thing too i've had people send me videos of their runoff water and you know it's like something's moving in there mm. organically um it wasn't right rice root aphids in this particular instance but still um, just curious because that can happen. Um, let's see here. And and also we had another question too. Uh, st speaking of things that could wash out, I think there were springtails. Uh, but oh. beneficials. Uh, somebody had asked about beneficials to fight right right. I cannot say rice root aphid for some reason. We'll call them root aphids. Root aphids. Thank you. We'll call uh, the root aphids. Um, everybody, if you missed it, still watching 45 minutes into the show, there is a slide um, that lists uh, the beneficials for you uh, that you had recommended. But uh, I imagine this might be crop specific. Do you? What is your go-to? What is your first line that you go to of those options? So what I like to do, step zero is if we don't have rice root aphids in the beginning, what I like to have like at the ready, um, ideally would be like, um, like in a home growth situation, even, um, you know, sort of having like banker plants, if you can cultivate them, okay. plants on your property that can attract things like parasitoid wasps, like little plant, like, uh, uh um, Sweet alyssum is a good example, and other plants like that that have little small florets, especially if they're native to your area. Um, I find a lot of parasitoid flies and wasps like to hang around them and drink the nectar. Um, so that's really helpful uh, because a lot of those parasitoids are aphid parasitoids, and some of them will affect uh, rice root aphids, for example, in your local area, potentially, as well as uh, your plants if they're able to access them. Um, and lace wings are another example of that. So cultivating us an area where you can maybe get more of a concentration of those uh, ambient biocontrols is great. That's like step zero, though. Um, step one, if you happen to see some rice root aphids and they're in your foliage, I like to apply things like lace wing larvae in particular. Also, those hoverfly larvae would be an example as well okay. of something you could attract. Um, but uh, yeah, lace wing larvae are usually my go-to. And... Um, for the foliage. And then, uh, then I might even add in uh, Orias or the might so the minute pirate bug, or possibly uh, one of a few parasitoid wasp species, like Aphidius metricarii, or Aphidius uh, uh, Irvi, I believe is also one. Uh, but also the Bouveria or the Isaria fungal pathogen is so important for the 
for the roots. I would start applying that as well if I could get access to um, such a product. Okay. And and we talked um, briefly kind of about clones being one way or, you know, I imagine sometimes soil might be a way. Um, but, you know, how do you get root aphids if you don't have them? Do they fly in? Uh, can they come in on your clothes? I, you know, I have definitely... I've definitely seen aphids on my clothing, uh, like after walking through a field or something, mm -hmm. um, or some brush, brush, or uh, or just simply like walking, even in like a sort of urban park. You know, sometimes aphids will drop from from trees, or you know, if it's the right season, like summer, for example, uh, is pretty common season where a lot of the aphids will be producing winged forms and moving around and. Um, you know, they'll just get caught. They're very, they're very small and dainty. So uh, when they fly, they're not like flying like a fly does, zipping around with great acuity. Uh, they're kind of, yeah. They're the kind drunk of, moth. Yes, exactly. They're very clumsy. So it's, and they're also not very strong. So it's easy for them to like land in like a, a wrinkle, you know, in your, mm. in your jacket or something. And then, uh, you know, maybe that's a way they can come in. Um, but usually when people get them, it's because they got plant material. This is also true in commercial settings, not just for cannabis, but across the world globally um, for a lot of insects besides aphids. Number one way. Number two way is probably coming in through some sort of a um, vulnerability in your physical structure. So like if it's in your home, maybe it gets in under your garage door or it gets in under like your, your door um hinge or something and it's just walking around aimlessly and maybe you know throughout the season maybe 20 do this but only one gets into your plants potentially that's like me i'm always going behind the doors to say authorized personnel only <laughs> i just assume that i am but yeah, yeah. And, and that actually leads into the next question and something that i had just written down too uh you had mentioned you know banker plants to attract these parasitic uh, wasps um, and you know, that's a good, like outside defense. Cause a lot of home growers is particularly in the summer will draw cool air in through a window mm. during the night into the room to kind of cool things down. Um, a lot of people do have filters. A lot of things will try to, you know, get rid of pollens. We'll try to get rid of insects, but sometimes there's always a way, but if you had these types of plants outside of that window versus something like uh, potent ponic steve said cilantro they love cilantro so i'd rather have something like this versus a whole bunch of cilantro outside of the window that i'm drawing air in uh and fish it off's question here was um did you have any good recommendations or what are some good plants to attract those type of wasps mm. or parasitics so, yeah so up front um i advocate for people to find sort of plants that are local to your environment that might fit this bill particularly. Um, I only say this because for one, if you're trying to grow in a way that's like, you know, conscientious of your environment, uh, you know, uh, a lot of plants that are available, people don't know this, of course, um, and I don't blame them because there's so many plants out there. How can you keep track? But uh, a lot of plants are invasive that are, um, that are sold in various places and uh, sometimes they can escape um, uh, cultivation, and that's not great for the local environment. So I know a lot of people are worried about that. So if you can do a native plant uh, that has these characteristics, that's great. Um, you can't just be responsible with how you're applying them. So uh, I find that uh, sweet alyssum, like I said earlier, is a really good one. So characteristics are things like having little small florets. I find that that seems to be really attractive for these small wasps, these small flies. Uh, lace wings even. Uh, having a lot of different repositories for nectar is really good. So some composite flowers mm. are good in this way. Of course, uh, so they can also have their own pests as well. So you got to be conscientious of that. Um, and be uh, when you're crop scouting your plants, you also should crop scout your property as well, especially if you're using baker plants. Um, uh, but yeah, so these small little florets with a lot of nectar, uh, you know, nectaries all, around them, um, are, are really useful. So instead of giving you different species that you could use, um, those characteristics tend to be pretty good, sort of generally speaking, uh, at least for those. 
Okay, and, and this question might have a couple different answers based upon the medium, but I see where Mikey Grow is going with this. He's asking about cocoa, and I mentioned different answers because it might be different for a bag of soil like a fox farm. Um, but it's kind of the first part is can they come in bags of cocoa? And then I think the, the real question, though, is, you know, how long can they live in cocoa with no plants as a host to feed on? So can they be dormant? Uh, can they travel uh, consider or taking into account that they stayed in the perfect temperature zone and all this through transit? Um, yeah. Is, is that something that people should be aware of is dormancy? And then all of a sudden, boom, you got it. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so aphids in general, they have to feed on living plant material. They aren't very, to answer your question directly. No, they're typically not dormant for long periods of time without food. Okay. Um, unless it's like a seasonal thing. So like some species of aphids, but we consider all the thousands of species that exist. Um, you know, this does happen sometimes and perhaps we will find right. this happens with rice root aphids in certain contexts. But generally speaking, their overwintering form, their dormancy form is as an egg, not as an adult. And if they have no food at all and it's not cold, uh, they will die pretty quickly because they are pretty much adapted to being like attached you know, at the mouth, uh, to their host, um, they're very adapted to their host, so they can't live very long without them. Um, so like in cocoa or some sort of potting soil or something like if it's, you know, I've had people say that they've gotten them through soil and I wouldn't say it's impossible, but I would say that if the soil or substrate has been, um, processed in some way, well, if it's been recycled irresponsibly, then that could be a problem, especially if they're, you know, recycling it. And then those bags are not like sitting for a long period of time Ooh. or however you're, you're uh, storing them and they're just going right out the door. I could conceive of it being plausible that that could happen. But generally speaking, I wouldn't expect like just soil because um, they have to eat plant food. They have to eat phloem. If they're not eating phloem, um, save for a few examples that feed on actually insect blood or people even uh, in small cases. Uh, that is uh, pretty much all there is to it for them. Okay, perfect. Great answer. Uh, and we've all probably seen Jurassic Park, so we know nature will find a way. It's true. <laughs> I saw a movie on it. It's real. Don't go there. Dangerous. Chris Pratt did it. Not so good. Um, and here, here's another question that you might have an answer to. I don't know if it's – well, it's not specifically on the topic today, but um, – I've heard you say Buveria bassiana many times. Um, mm -hmm. So the question is, if we use Buveria bassiana, will we kill off beneficials too? You could, potentially. Um, that's an important thing to bring up. So as much as I love Buveria bassiana, Azirifuma sorcia, and, you know, various fungal pathogens like this, they are broad, you know, they're broad spectrum. They're generalists, just like aphids for that matter, some of them. Um, so they'll feed on many different hosts. And if you're not careful with how you're integrating your pest management, then you might run into some negative effects. Although, generally speaking, I don't find that it is super aggressive, especially against the commercially available um, beneficials. And what I mean by that is that I wouldn't expect it to cause a failure um, okay. unless the biocontrols were sort of harried in some other way that makes them stressed out or not uh, effective, perhaps you didn't apply enough. And so maybe the small percentage of kill that you got on those was enough to like really be problematic. Um, but also for your natural environment too, you, you know, just be, be cautious of it. Don't apply it willy nilly. It's true for any treatment ever. Don't just assume that because it's a natural organism or something that uh, it can't have any detrimental effect on the ecology. Um, so, but like specifically, these fungal, path these fungal pathogens tend to be, um, they tend to target what are called true bugs. So like aphids, for example, or for beneficials, we'd have like Arias minute pirate bugs would be an example. Um, certain assassin, assassin bugs in general would be an example of that. Um, certain predatory stink bugs, I guess, and things like this. So um, other insects, I think, are less affected generally. It's cool you mentioned that and we've you know we've got a pretty smart chat in here i saw somebody talking about stink bugs earlier uh justin okay mid rosie uh when you know you were you're talking about uh 
plants, banker plants for parasitics, look locally, try to go that. He had kind of mentioned that too. So that's awesome to see in here. Uh, I'm, I'm by the beach. Scotch broom is a wildly invasive species down here. Um, until you see an invasive species take over an area, it, it's hard to kind of really grasp the concept. So yeah, excellent answer there. And I want to let everybody know too, we've got just a couple more minutes um, before we're going to wrap things up. So if you have any last minute questions, please get them in. But, you know, a lot of a lot of compliments, as always, again today. Uh, you know, thank you for the show. Uh, thank you, Matthew. There we go. Justin's okay. It's up there. Um, but yeah, you know, he's making all of this information free. Um, you can always go back and watch it anytime. So that is invaluable, I think. Um, to wrap it up, in far as prevention, one of the main things that you said here is coverage is crucial. So there's almost not uh, such a thing as overkill when it comes to trying to treat these initially, aside from phytotoxicity. <laughs> oh, did you ask me a question? <laughs> well, <laughs> sometimes they're rambling sentences that Sorry, I just yeah, end it was, it and was look. A little bit, yeah, yes, no. Then you upticked, and I was like, "What?" <laughs> yeah, no. Um, but coverage is crucial. Yes, for absolutely. for prevention. I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. I, no, it's it's actually probably the biggest like first time mistake when it comes to sometimes using these compounds is one you assume that it's one and done, which is almost never the case. Okay. And a big part of that being not the case is coverage, like you're saying. Um, so basically, uh, you just got to make sure that you're, you know, if you have very dense foliage and not just for cannabis, but other plants, it's going to retard the efficacy of the compound because they're contact killers. They're not systemic. Um, so that's why it's so important. And the fungal uh, parasites for the same way. You don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want to apply them to runoff, actually, since you mentioned that. Mm hmm. You want to apply them, um, usually in most labels, uh, they'll say that you want to apply them up to the point right before runoff and then stop there uh, because you're kind of wasting product because you're just having spores that are just leaving and they're not going anywhere. Um, so, you, And usually you want to keep the, the substrate a little bit moist and then let it sort of dry out or vice versa. Sometimes you dry it out, you you water it till it's full and then you leave it and... Um, and yeah, so those are some things to consider. There's some intricacies with, with spraying compounds when you're being responsible. Cool. I am going to check my calendar here because I'm going to put you on the spot again. February 8th. That's another two weeks. Are we going to be back with another episode? Uh, probably. Let me also confirm that. Okay. Okay. I just want to let everybody out there know because I know last time, you know, we had a great response in the comment section on the video. Again, um, please tell us uh, what you would like to hear Matthew Gates talk about. Uh, he, yeah. he can talk about a lot. So please, yeah, go ahead and mention that. Yeah, no, on, honestly, I would have. I, also, I can do eight, the eighth, certainly. Okay. Uh, the, the week before is my birthday, actually. Yay. So, um, All so right. I, will be, uh, I will be available the week after. And, um, and yeah, so yeah, please, people who are interested in me, uh, looking at, uh, a pest for us to present, like, please let me know, please let me know the comments here in the chat. I do look at the chat. I do look at the comments. And if you've seen me on any of my YouTube interviews, I go to the comments and I answer people's questions. I definitely make an effort to do that because it's important for me to, for people to get good information. A hundred percent. And I love that you... You'll, you'll back up any comments that you made with uh, citations uh, or at least point to where we get this information because that's so important. It's easy to put words together, but uh, backing them up is another story. And that's what takes the time, folks. <laughs> that is definitely true. In fact, speaking of which, um, I just want to echo your, uh, your video that you posted on your own channel recently about uh, evaluating uh claims right or was it research in general yep. was it yeah it's just white yeah. papers versus research papers again it's almost that pyrethrin pyrethrum people get yes. the two confused and interchange them but there's a big difference so i definitely i've even said it myself and i've, I've said one when i've meant the other 
yep. um, or thought one was one, but it was the other. And, and it can be hard sometimes, even for experts. <laughs> yeah. Guilty, guilty myself. So we'll, we'll wrap that up with the uh, we're human too. But uh, yes. we never give up on learning, folks. So please, uh, if you see us make a mistake, let us know. But do it nicely. <laughs> please. And we'll do the same. Yes, we'll, we'll do the same. Uh, but until then, we will be back on February 8th, same time, 3 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, 6 p.m. Eastern. Again, the quick notes, 44 minutes in. Catch the reproduction cycle of the rice root aphid said masterfully there uh and 45 minutes in catch the beneficial insects matthew gates recommends to get rid of them uh any any final words or uh shout outs or where people can find you matthew today yeah absolutely i think i'll just say one more time that um xenthanol right here uh that's me and you can find most of my educational content on my YouTube channel, Zenthanol, and also on my Instagram, my personal Instagram, at Sync Angel. Those are probably my two biggest active platforms where you can opine. And uh, let me know what the next pest is that we're going to take a look at. Awesome. All right. Everybody, get your votes in. We'll be keeping our eyes on those. And we will see you next time. Thanks for joining us today. Super appreciate you guys. Super awesome. Catch you later.